Killer lamb chops. Is Kate's arm back and my inability to perform in stressful situations? This week's episode of The Boys has given me PTSD from when my ex used to say things like this. Excuse me, hi, did I say you could take out your vibrating Bluetooth anal beads? In this video, we'll be taking a deep dive into the episode, its connection to Gen V, and some of the show's biggest theories, like is Joe Kessler real? What did Sage show Tech Knight in her journal? And what sort of plan is Ashley cooking against Homelander? So grab a bloom and onion and and get ready to lobotomize yourself because here we go. Let's take a ride through time with a history of Vought Entertainment, starting with 1953's classic The Curse of Fu Manchu starring Bombsight. This is a spoof of the supervillain Dr. Fu Manchu who appeared in a series of highly racist novels as well as films starring Boris Karloff. Up next, Liberty's Budweiser campaign from 1957. We actually saw this poster way back in season two. In my last video, I talked about how Stormfront, who was once the soup known as Liberty, just might be Homelander's mother. So if you're interested in learning more about that, definitely check it out. And it's our favorite chimp-loving soup, Crimson Countess, in 1967's Crimson. We also get our first look at Big Chief Apache, who the legend mentioned in season three. After the marathon man premiere, Roy Scheider, Dustin, Angelica, Big Chief Apache. This is a spoof on the 1970 Keep America Beautiful ad starring Iron Eyes Cody, who after his death, it was revealed he wasn't Native American at all, but Sicilian. The 60s, 70s, and 80s were dominated by films by members of Payback, including 1979's This Means Noir, starring Black Noir, Soldier Boy, and the TNT Twins, who met their demise at Herogasm. 1984's Whiskey Sunrise was produced by the legend and also starred Soldier Boy and Gunpowder. The poster for 1988's Red Thunder 2 really reminds me of another 1988 action film, Die Hard. As we get into the 90s, Vought shifts away from Payback and into The Seven, where we have 1999's Y2 Chaos starring Lamplighter. The 2000s feature films by Queen Maeve, The Deep, and May He Rest in Peace, Translucent. My favorite is his invisible statue at Godolkin U. But the tentpole film in the Vought universe is 2022's Dawn of the Seven. It's crazy to think that it was all the way back in season two that we saw them filming it, and season three they had the premiere. Even Vought's movies have ads for Vought in them, like this Turbo Rush sign on the side of this bus. Vought's collection of programs can be seen here, like American Hero, which Starlight hosted last season. There's Vought News, starring everyone's favorite submissive, Cameron Coleman, and Vought Plus, where students like Emma Meyer could watch all the latest termite picks. This is all part of Vought's V52 Expo, a take on Disney's D23. And is it just me, or did they purposely choose 52 because it kind of looks like it spells out sex? Our hosts for the occasion are the deep and trusted news anchor, Cameron Coleman, but we'll soon see these two got beef. Cameron reported on the deep getting fired as head of crime analytics, so in retaliation, the Deep is going to sleep with his wife, but Cameron also knows that the Deep still keeps his naughty octopus lover, Ambrosius, tucked away in his closet. So for now, the two seem to be at a stalemate. That is until Sister Sage implies to A-Train that she is close to figuring out who the Vought leaker is. And I'm not talking about Homelander. That footage didn't just run itself out of crime analytics. Am I right? In episode two, A-Train gave up security camera footage which exonerated two men accused of killing our beloved Todd and two other men at the Homelander trial riot. Does Sage really know it was A-Train who leaked the footage or was her innuendo merely a coincidence? As the smartest person on earth, I doubt it's the latter. A-Train and Sage also have some beef from their time as members of Teenage Kicks. When Sage was vetted as a potential member of the Seven, A-Train says this about her. She's the world's smartest person. She's not smart enough to know when to shut her mouth. What happened between him and her all those years ago? Luckily, A-Train is saved with the help of Ashley. Ashley's been secretly punishing Cameron's balls, but when she's demoted as CEO of Vought, he says he needs someone more dominant to fill his needs. So in retaliation, she sets Cameron up as the leaker, where it's implied she set up fake calls between him and Mother's Milk. We'll see her smiling outside the boardroom as Cameron is brutally beaten by the Seven. Is Cameron dead? Well, we never see him actually die, but if what happened to the original girl who was thought to be the leaker is any indication, he won't be in much luck. Ashley also has a vested interest to protect A-Train. Last episode, the two of them found each other sneaking into Homelander's apartment. A-Train was looking for Compound V to give Huey to save his dad, but we never find out what Ashley was really there for, besides the shit in the toilet. Hey. 
You've done a lot more than just take a shit. And we both know that. This is still a mystery. Remember, Ashley has wanted to get out of Vought for some time, but feels like her life is in danger should she try to quit. We even see her rip up a letter of resignation. Whatever Ashley is doing likely involves her trying to look for a way out. Maybe she's collecting dirt on Homelander should she ever be in a position to be killed by him. Homelander is also at the expo, having recently returned from his trip back home. Homelander's goal this episode is to mend the relationship with his son, Ryan, who he got in a fight with at the end of episode 3. Homelander takes a different approach to gain his son's affection. Instead of dictating every aspect of his life, he'll let Ryan decide. This starts with the rejection of director Adam Bork's new TV series, Super School, which we can actually see here on the slate of upcoming projects. He got the inspiration for the show while teaching at actual Super School, Godolkin University. The only reason Adam was there in the first place was to cool off after he flashed his penis to actress Minka Kelly, so the man has a history of doing unwanted things to women. Homelander asks his son what he really wants to do with his life. Ryan wants to help people, but not fake help like what he tried to do in episode 2. And this starts with Adam's PA, Bonnie, who's received unwanted advances by Adam, and he deserves to be punished. Ryan and Homelander have a genuine father and son moment here as they revel in the pain they're causing Adam. So Homelander may have just found his way to bond with his son while simultaneously being that insane sadistic fuck. Just like Marvel's MCU, Vought has its own phases filled with superhero films and shows, the earliest being A-Train's training A-Train which we saw him filming at the beginning of episode 2. Some of my favorites include faith-based films starring Firecracker, an X-Men Days of Futures Past ripoff called G-Men Days Past from the Future, the seven films titled Reborn, Returns, and Forever, similar to the Batman titles, and a raunchy teen sex comedy called Sex Ed. With time running out, Butcher and Kessler have a little convo about what's next. As far as we know, no one other than Butcher has interacted with Kessler, leading many to believe he is a figure of Butcher's imagination and possibly a manifestation of that worm-like entity in his body. While investigating Victoria Newman's secret lab, Butcher will free a rabbit that was injected with Temp V, the same stuff Butcher abused which resulted in his condition. He'll later find that same rabbit on the verge of death before tentacles rip through its chest, perhaps foreshadowing what will happen to Butcher. Last episode, Butcher blacked out while fighting the Christian soup Ezekiel, only to wake up to find him dead. Could whatever is killing Butcher from the inside be the thing that actually saved him? The boys decide to get their hands on the soup-killing virus produced by Dr. Edison Cardosa at Godolkin U. The only problem is that it's in the possession of Victoria Newman, and they don't know where to look. So they enlist the help of former Vought CEO and adoptive father of Victoria, Stan Edgar. On the official Vought International Twitter account, we can see that Stan was arrested for crimes against Vought, including classified documents which were just casually lying around his vacation home. A clear take on another famous businessman who had classified documents at his Mar-a-Lago home. In exchange for his help acquiring the virus, he will get a full presidential pardon. At first, Stan isn't too keen on the deal, and it's only after he finds out that Victoria injected his granddaughter Zoe with Compound V that he agrees to help. If this mission is a success, he'll also get full custody of her. Stan takes them to his countryside estate, where indeed Victoria has set up a lab to continue the development of the virus. Remember that when she received this virus from Dr. Cardosa, it wasn't strong enough to take down someone like Homelander. However, it looks like new versions were created when Frenchie finds missing vials of recent test samples. The arrival of Victoria Newman puts a wrench in their plans and some blood down their noses. It was Victoria who helped put Stan in prison, so I wouldn't want to be around one of their family dinners. I'm sorry. Are you upset that I betrayed you? What I found really interesting here is what happens to Starlight's powers. Victoria seems a bit shocked by it too. At first I thought it could be Victoria causing this malfunction. She'll later chastise Starlight for not using it in their time of need. You're not much used to us if your powers were on the fucking fritz. Plus, it's been almost three seasons and we've never known Victoria to have such a power. The only thing I could think of interfering with her power is either Stan, Butcher, or her own insecurities. We still don't know the full extent of whatever is taking over Butcher's body, and Stan is just a wild card. There is one line that Stan says to Starlight that really kind of threw me off. What an unexpected pleasure. Hmm. You know, I've always felt a certain kinship with you. 
What does he mean by this? It felt very out of the blue to me. Stan and Starlight have had very little one-on-one -on -one time these past four seasons, so I'm not sure why he thinks they have a certain kinship. There's also the possibility Starlight is having some sort of inner crisis about being Starlight that is affecting her power. Remember that at the end of Season 3, she wanted nothing to do with being Starlight and even threw away her costume. She is so sensitive about this topic that she ends up punching Victoria after she says this. And shit, you've been Starlight for so long, do you even know who Annie is anymore? <laughs> Starlight has been under immense pressure considering the fallout of her attack on Firecracker. Her Starlight home has been vandalized, she's been exposed for having an abortion, and Firecracker spreads fake news that Starlight was behind the death of Ezekiel. To make matters worse, Firecracker has exploded in popularity with her own show Truth Bomb on Vought News and a slate of faith-based films like Lord Soldier. I was also amazed at the show's commentary on targeted ads, with movies and shows adding targeted ad placement depending on what race you are. White people, for example, will get an IPA while black people peach cognac. The sad thing is that this isn't too far from reality. Sites like YouTube and Facebook know, based on your browsing history, what age, sex, race, and location you're from, and target you with ads accordingly to maximize effectiveness. As a white man, I do want to say I am still very excited for Black Addict. Stan expresses his disapproval of Victoria injecting Zoe with Compound V, effectively turning her into what he thinks is a monster. But it's Victoria who says that Zoe shouldn't have to hide who she is. She shouldn't have to be ashamed. My daughter will never have to live like that. This is rather eerie as it echoes what Homelander said to her in episode 3. Do you want her to hate herself as well? Be ashamed of herself? That's what this is about. The episode spices up with the introduction of Zoe's baby daddy, Dr. Samir Shah. He used to work for Vought's research and development division until it was found out he was banging the CEO's daughter. Now Victoria has enlisted his help to create this virus. Unfortunately, there was a tragic accident and Compound V leaked into the groundwater after a hamster injected with Compound V trashed the lab. And it's wild to say this isn't the first time the boys have encountered a flying hamster. Now all the farm animals have turned into flying bloodthirsty soups with the gang having to seek protection in a nearby barn. The plan to escape involves injecting the dead body of Samir's lab assistant with the virus and feeding it to the animals. According to Dr. Shaw, the virus can only be transferred via bodily fluids, and the time it takes to take effect varies from case to case. The plan is actually a success, but in the chaos, Samir is lost with the only thing of his found part of his leg. If you rewind their escape, you can see three different groups go in three different directions. There's Victoria and Stan over here, Frenchie, Starlight, Kimiko, and Mother's Milk in the middle, and Butcher and Samir on on the right. Butcher had Samir's leg cut off to give off the illusion he was killed, but Butcher has other plans. He wants him alive and well so he can craft that virus for the boys. The appearance of Joe Kessler at the end here makes it even more likely that he is some sort of manifestation of Butcher's. I find it hard to believe that this guy was lurking around the farmhouse for hours just to show up for this scene. Butcher turns to Kessler and says the line, we'll patch you up, and Samir looks over in his direction, but he gives one of those ambiguous looks where we're not sure if he's actually seeing anyone, or if Butcher is just crazy talking to no one. One of the things that crossed my mind was, what if a human injected with this virus has sex with a soup? Yes, these are the weird things I think about. Since humans are unaffected by the virus, could they still pass it on unknowingly to a soup? With no virus in their possession, Stan is brought back into custody, where his car is taken over by Newman. Although these two have betrayed each other, they're still family, and I gotta believe Newman is springing her dad out. I was pleasantly surprised at the amount of airtime Tech Knight got this episode. Not only does he have a bunch of new films and shows coming out, but he's invited to Homelander's secret meeting with the Seven with Sam and Kate. It makes me think he'll have a bigger part to play in the episodes to come. I also love how the first thing he says when he's on stage is, it's been a whole year. Notice how Sister Sage is showing him something from her journal, something he's shocked by. I've racked my brain on what this could be. Maybe it's that Victoria Newman is a soup who's going to join their side and take over as president. Did I totally miss something here? Let me know in the comments. Our very own Guardians of Godolkin, Sam and Kate, make their first appearance since we last saw them in the Gen V finale. Homelander knows that Sam and Kate's values, meaning the subjugation and killing of humans, aligns with his. 
The others, Marie, Jordan, Emma, and Andre, are currently in an undisclosed location sipping on smoothies. We don't know where they are at the moment, but showrunner Eric Kripke said the finale of Season 4 of The Boys will tie into the premiere of Season 2 of Gen V, so maybe they'll make an appearance. Notice Kate's arm is back. At the end of Gen V, it was blown off by Marie Moreau. While it is covered, it could mean that she's either wearing a prosthetic or regenerated. We do know she possesses faster than normal regenerative healing, but the extent of which is unknown. Homelander's speech to his gang of revolutionaries is truly chilling. He's laying the groundwork for a violent takeover of America and perhaps even the world. No longer will they be beloved celebrities, rather wrathful gods. But Homelander says they have to bide their time. They'll know when it's time to strike, and my guess is that it has something to do with the assassination of the president. The finale is called Assassination Run, so I think that's what this season is leading up to. Mother's Milk also has to deal with his rebellious daughter Janine, who's recently been involved in some school fights. Even though he tells his daughter fighting is not how you solve problems, how do you tell your daughter that when fighting is what you do for a living? His ex-wife Monique tells him to fix this, so consider this a part of Mother's character arc this season. Huey is absolutely shocked when his father comes out of his coma after his mother Daphne injected him with Compound V. She says the vial popped out of Huey's coat and that she did it thinking that's what her son would have wanted. It's not, however, what Huey Sr. wants. He tells the story of their cat Jar Jar, who Huey couldn't let go of and thus it suffered in its final days. Huey Sr. does not want to end up like Jar Jar. This is why he gave Daphne power of attorney. He wanted a do not resuscitate when his son would want to hold on. In my past two videos I've talked about a theory that Daphne could be a figment of Huey's imagination too, but this episode kills that theory when a nurse interacts with her. After years of abandonment, Daphne finally apologizes to her son for not being there. She even gives him her engagement ring so he can one day give it to Annie. While things initially seem fine, things are not well with Huey Sr. He misremembers things, isn't sure where he is, and doesn't have a recollection of killing fellow patients. He also has the ability to teleport through walls and objects. With the hospital in lockdown and his father a danger to himself and others, Huey makes the decision to put down his father using a concoction of drugs taught to him by Frenchie. Huey has finally learned to let go. After Frenchie told Colin that he killed his entire family, the man is understandably MIA, and Frenchie has spiraled doing drugs in front of everyone without a care in the world. Frenchie picks up this rosary and talks about how forgiveness is bullshit. Some scenes deserve eternal damnation. Frenchie won't even talk to Kimiko about his past because he's afraid he might scare her off, or worse, that she'll accept him. So Frenchie turns himself into the police, confessing to murder as a form of penance for his sins. So episode 5 sets up a lot of moving parts as we enter the latter half of the season. Now I turn it over to you. What did you think of the episode? I want to hear your thoughts and theories in the comments below. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe. And for more bad takes, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at ThinkStoryYT. Until next time, remember... Excuse me. Hi. Did I say you could take out your vibrating Bluetooth anal beads?